Good morning, church, and welcome. It's great to have so many of you with us today, and thank you also to everybody who is joining us on live stream. It's great to be celebrating and worshiping God together with you all. Today, we've got some exciting things planned. First, Thomas will be leading us in worship. Otherwise, P afterwards, Peter will be leading us in communion, and then Simon is preaching. I would like to start the service with a small reading from Psalm 32. When I was thinking about the service this week, it's just something that popped to my mind, and I would like to start with it. I want to start in verse number six. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment, for you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and a bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout out for joy, all whose hearts are pure. Let us do exactly that. Let us all worship. Amen. Let's stand and worship God together. The battle belongs to you. 
through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you
every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance. I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth. song when I um, when I first heard it in the bridge bit where you're bringing your fears and doubts along with you and I was like why would you do that because surely you want to like leave them at the cross and walk away and know that Jesus got it and that kind of does work a lot of the time you can you can leave everything at the cross and know that he's got it but actually sometimes you're not going to just be able to let those down immediately there are going to be things that take longer to deal with and you're going to have to carry those a while and it's going to suck but you have to deal with it but you know that Jesus is so much bigger 
because actually we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He is bigger, he is better than it could ever be. It's a matter of perspective. Are your fears and doubts that you have to bring with you, are they bigger than God and his place in your heart? It's interesting, we were talking about perspective earlier, and we were talking about uh, bless you and the origins, and uh, me and Matt had different ideas, which were still along the same track, because I thought it was bless you when you sneeze, because you were sneezing out the demons, and Matt was saying, well, no, no, you, you were blessing you, because when you're sneezing, that's when you're vulnerable. And it's still the same sort of idea, and someone's going to say, well, actually, you're totally wrong, both of you, and you're just, it's, it's QI clacks, you've got it totally wrong, you've totally misread it, but actually, it's interesting, the perspective. It could be that actually you're seizing it out and you're getting rid of it, bless you, or it could be that you're weak, but actually, what's your perspective? Is your perspective that you're getting rid of the rubbish, or is your perspective that it's too big? And actually, in this new horizon, whatever you have to carry with you, if you can't lay it down straight away, that God is bigger and God is better than you're going to have to deal with. And so we're going to go through that, that bridge again, and we're going to and, and let, let go of what you can let go of. Don't carry stuff unnecessarily when Jesus says you can let it go. But if there's stuff that you do have to hold on to for now, it helps you that focus that Jesus is bigger, Jesus is better, and by perspective... He is so much better than anything that you're going to have to deal with. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to Because they can't stay long when I'm here with you It's a new horizon, I'm set on you And you need me here today with mercies that are new
we're going to take communion in a moment. So if you'd like to take your seats. Last night, Donna and I watched a film called um, I Can Only Imagine, which is based on the true story of how a song with the same title, I Can Only Imagine, um, was written and became the most popular Christian song in America ever. One of the main themes of the film is forgiveness and how the author of the song, a chap called Bart, who's, who is a Christian by the way, um, ultimately forgives his abusive father. After the father becomes a Christian and says to Bart, why won't God forgive me? Bart tells him that he already has. But Bart is struggling through, with his own forgiveness through his father. The story goes on, Bart forgives his father. I don't want to ruin it for everybody if you want to watch it. But Bart does forgive his father. The father dies and then Bart wrote, writes this song. And at the first proper public performance, dedicates it to his father. So this morning as we take communion, I want to focus on forgiveness. And if you're struggling with feeling forgiven by God this morning, then I want to tell you that God has already forgiven you. He did so when Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, which is one of the things we remember and think about when we take communion. And if, that, if that's you, then I encourage you, as we take the bread and wine, ask God for forgiveness and ask God to help you know that forgiveness. And if you're struggling to forgive someone, give it to God and ask for his strength and love to help you forgive. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we take communion this morning, Lord, that you would just fill us, fill us new, Lord, with your forgiveness. Let us know, Lord, that you have forgiven us and help us to forgive other people as well. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew 26, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Can I have two volunteers, please, to serve the bread? Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, drink from it, all of you. Can I have two more volunteers, please, to serve the wine?
And before we sing one more song, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to pray for a few people in our church who, who really need some prayer at the moment. So if you're able, if you would stand with me while I pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Lord, I thank you for everything that he achieved when he died on that cross, Lord. And I thank you that three days later, he rose again, Lord. And Lord, we lift Margaret Clark to you now, Lord, and her extended family, Lord. And we just pray healing and health over Margaret, Lord, and wisdom to all the professionals that are helping in that situation, Lord. I just pray that you would just be with every, every member of that family, Lord, and they would know that you are sovereign in this situation. And Lord, we pray for the Clifford family as well, Lord, particularly for Andy as he lost his father this week, Lord, and we just pray that that whole family would know you as their comforter, Lord, that they would know that you are always there for them. Lord, and I just pray for anybody else, Lord, who, who needs a touch from you this morning, Lord. I just speak healing and health and wholeness over everyone, Lord. And I just pray a blessing on everyone in this house today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing this next song, I'm going to pass around the collection bag. So if you could be ready for that. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas.
majesty. Your grace has found me just as I am. Empty handed but alive in your hands. Majesty. I would like us to stay in this moment of worship a little bit longer. And if we could, could we sing the last song again one more time? And I would invite you to look around and see if there might be someone that you could pray for. And feel free to move around as you walk over to someone that you feel might need a hand on their shoulder and an encouraging word in their ears. So please, Thomas, could we sing this last song again? And let's pray for each other as well as we do so. If you're currently praying for someone, please don't feel obligated to stop. Please move on as you feel that the Spirit is leading you. And I would, I would also like this moment to be a moment of prayer for our world. We hear of so many conflicts around us all the time in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, but I know that there are also so many conflicts that we don't hear about. And Lord, we pray for your for a healing power in these situations where there's conflict and war and suffering going on. Lord, I pray for your spirit to be there and bring peace. And Lord, I also pray for us to become, become peacemakers in our situations, wherever we might be. It might be in our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, at school, at work, it doesn't matter where. Lord, help us to bring peace into those situations. And Lord, I also pray for a blessing for all those peoples that are affected by the terrible floods that have been happening all over the world recently. Lord, we pray for your protection and for your guidance for the policymakers to find a way forward, to move forward and rebuild the places. Lord, we pray for your, for your healing and for your peace and kindness upon those that have been affected by it that they may be able to rebuild their lives and find hope in knowing that you are God, that you are our Lord. Amen. Please take a seat. Thank you so much, Ben, for leading us in worship today.
I'm sure most of you are aware, but tomorrow is a bank holiday. <laughs> yeah. Before I forget it, I would like to remind you, unfortunately, there won't be any discipleship group today because of bank holiday. On Wednesday, though, we're going to have a Holy Spirit group again. If you would like to be involved or have any questions about it, please feel free to speak about it with Leon, and I'm sure he will be able to help you. Also, in two weeks' time, on the 16th of May, there will be a joint service at the Vine at 10 a.m., so please feel free to come to the Vine in two weeks, 10 a.m., for a joint service. If you show up here, unfortunately, there won't be much happening. Each week, we also take some time to celebrate together for all the wonderful things that God has done in our lives. So if you feel like there has been something you would like to share with everybody and would like to celebrate together, it would be great if you could come up to the front now and let's celebrate. <laughs> You're first, of course. What are you celebrating today? I won my finals yesterday. You won your finals. Congratulations. Hey, <laughs> brilliant. What are you celebrating, Melody? Um, in our school, we, uh, in my class, we do something called Star Student, and I got Star Student um, on Friday. You got Star Student, brilliant, well done, well done, exciting. Peter, what are you celebrating? Uh, it's our um, wedding anniversary tomorrow. Aww. Hey. <laughs> Take something with you for Donna as well, please. Gabriella. Um, I just wanted to celebrate, as Ed would know and Ian would know, and even our Tyler will know, yesterday's events at um, Kent Revival Prayer Group, I think that's what it's called. Um, we can really see God move, and we ended up having a complete random man come off the street while we're in the middle of our group asking for prayer, um, which is amazing, and we all got to share the gospel with him and pray for him. I'd just like to ask you all, though, to also pray for him. His name is Steve. He's struggling with alcoholism, um, and he's struggling to let go and actually give his life to God, apart from he knows that prayer works. That's why he keeps coming and asking for prayer. And just to encourage you all, God's moving. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gabriella. <laughs> let us quickly pray for Steve as well, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for guiding Steve to the prayer group yesterday. And thank you so much for showing him who you are and what you can be. And that you're so much stronger and greater than addiction. And Lord, I pray for everyone who is currently addicted to alcohol or any other thing that is not good. Because we know that you are good and you are the one thing that we need in our lives. Amen. Great, now it's time for the kid, children and youths to head out. They're very excited about it. And whilst they're heading out, I would like to pray for them and for everyone who is helping them as well. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the lovely children and youth in our community. They're such a blessing to our lives. And Lord, I would also like to thank you for everyone who's taking their time and teaching them about who you are. Thank you so much for all the amazing volunteers that are doing this every single week. Amen. And now I would like to firstly double check that I didn't forget anything. But I'm pretty certain now it's time for Simon to come up. And before I hand over, I would li also like to pray for you, Simon. Thank you so much, Lord, for having Simon among us. He's a brilliant blessing for our community, for our church, for everything that he is doing. And Lord, I pray for your guidance and for your wisdom as he's preaching to us and speaking to us. And I would also like for your wisdom for us as a congregation to know and to listen to what he's saying, to understand what it is that he's talking about and let your word be the center of everything. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Uh, 
Okay, can you hear me? Excellent. There was a small extra matter to celebrate yesterday. We're back in the Premier League. <laughs> Despite uh, Maidstone United's uh, little triumph over us, Ipswich Town are now going places. <laughs> yep, Forest Green last year, Liverpool next. <laughs> yep. Um, you may remember the last time I spoke here was uh, a few, uh, few weeks ago now, was on the subject of the parable. Does this thing come up? Oh, that's it. Great. Thank you. Um, I spoke on the parable of the torn clothes and the burst wineskins, and that was really the first of a sort of a intermittent series that I, I hope to be able to share with you on, on the parables of Jesus. Um, why particularly the parables of Jesus? Well, Jesus spoke the parables in a very big way because he wanted people to understand what the kingdom of God was all about in terms that they could understand and relate to. And as a church here who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, who believes that he died for us and that he's, by his death on the cross and resurrection, we are made, made reconciled with God and brought into a marvelous new kingdom. I think it does rather well for us to concentrate on some of the things that Jesus said, yeah? So what we're going to do this morning is look at one of the next one of the parable, which I've called here the wheat and the weeds. And uh, if we just have the next slide, please... Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so parables, as I just said, why, why parables? And Jesus spoke in parables. So am, am I standing in people's way here? I probably am a bit. Let's back off. Um, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. Well, that's interesting that, that he used that teaching method as being absolutely fundamental to his ministry. And he says, so was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. And I'd really like you just to think about that last line there. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. And that is really what the whole message of Jesus' ministry on earth was. That he was bringing a new world into place, a new kingdom of God, a new kingdom of heaven, things that had been hidden before despite the, 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 the history of the Jewish people who had been brought via Abraham, Moses, David and so on into, a, into all sorts of blessings, but Jesus, the coming of Jesus was the transformational work that we, he reveals to us through his parables and which we do well, I think, to focus upon. So next one, please. So this is, this is, this, this is the parable that we, we read here. So, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Just that the kingdom of heaven is. Now, Jesus began most of his parables with the kingdom of heaven is. He didn't say the kingdom of heaven is will be, he said, the kingdom of heaven is. So it's present tense, therefore it relates to us in the here and now. It's like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, and I'm going to come back to that word sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. Next one. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, 
First, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. It's a well-known parable. It's quite a well-known story. But it's this picture of malice, of someone who is sowing a good crop with an expectation of fruitfulness, an expectation of product that is worthwhile, and someone is out to stymie him, to prevent it, to infiltrate, to confuse and make a something poor. Now, I'd like to, if we just have the next slide, this, what is this weed that they talk about? Sometimes called tares in the old versions of, of the Bible. It's a plant called darnel, sometimes called cockle, um, which is a that's very similar looking to wheat when it's growing in its early stages of life. Basically, you cannot really distinguish them apart. And you can see there where you've got young wheat on your left-hand side and darnel on the right-hand side, that they are quite difficult to separate. And it's only when the, 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 the uh, wheat and the darnel is fully into their ears that you can really distinguish the two clearly. When wheat has the quite familiar look of a, of a sort of a soft brown, beigey brown color, but the darnel, the, the seed becomes much darker, almost, almost black, and then it's quite easy to tell the two apart. So there's, I think there's something quite significant in that comparison because it says, as it says in the scripture, the, the man says, leave it until the ears are fully there and when you can actually see the difference because at the early stages, you cannot see the difference. Those servants of the, of the owner could see there was something wrong there, but it, they couldn't see it clearly enough to be able to distinguish it properly. Now, that isn't the only unfortunate characteristic of this plant called darnel, because it is also a plant that is subject to a kind of a fungus, um, which if, if eaten or consumed, um, can actually have some quite difficult circumstances. Apparently, it can, if, you, if you eat it, it can cause a, a, something like intoxication, a sense of muddleness, a sense of drowsiness, and you'll see some old pictures sometimes of people who said they've eaten darnel, sort of lying around, sort of looking um, rather vaguely up into the air. In extreme cases, it can actually kill you as fungus. So it's, it's stuff that isn't, isn't good to eat and enjoy. So here we have this scriptural comparison between the good seed, the wheat, that which will grow and will feed people and bless people, and this other weed called darnel which is actually injurious to people and can actually cause quite serious health. And that's a bit of a picture, if you like, between God's world and the devil's world. But the owner says something quite interesting here. He says, leave it be, don't try and root it up, even though it's coming into ear, because not only are the ears up there, the roots are down there, and the roots get entwined. And if you do any gardening at all, you know how roots get entwined, um, and sometimes it's difficult. I was only weeding a bed the other day, um, and uh, I suddenly realized how certain forms of grass can look very like a form of self-sown allium that we've got growing in the garden. And I was busy pulling out the alliums when I thought I was pulling out grass, so I thought, this is, this is not good. But that's the sort of thing that you get. And then we also get subject to this evil plant called bindweed, which some of you who are interested in garden might be only too familiar with, which has these long, sinuous roots that just go through everything. Can you get rid of the stuff? No, you have a centimetre left in the ground, it grows like mad. Um, but So if you try and dig up the wheat, or lift, sorry, lift, dig out the weeds, the darnel, you're going to pull up so much more with it that is of value. So the owner says, leave it. Leave it until it's all ready to harvest. Then you'll be able to see very clearly what is what, and you'll be able to distinguish it, and there'll be, you can separate it all out then. But there's an interesting point in here, because it's the, the wheat continues to grow, even though the weeds are there. And this is, this is something that I think is significant, because if the, 
owner was worried that the wheat might be killed off by this weed, he might have taken a different line. But he knows that the wheat is good seed. It is strong. It will continue to grow, even though it has got all these weeds around it. The, weed, the wheat itself is not imperiled by this weed growing around it. Now, this parable, next one, please, is unusual um, in that um, Jesus then provides something of an explanation about it, which he does a few verses later in Matthew 13. It says here, Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. For Jesus to actually provide an explanation of a parable shows that he really wants there to be no misunderstanding of what this is about. He really wants this to be very clear to, the, to his listeners that this is something that they need to understand, to hear, and get clear in their minds. And he makes very clear, who sows the good seed? It is the Lord himself. What is the good seed? It's us, you and I, those whom God has put his Holy Spirit within and planted out into the world. We are the good seed of the kingdom of heaven. But there is this other enemy at work called the devil. And the devil, represented by the darnel weed, is out there also planting other seed in the world. And sadly, that seed grows as well. And sometimes it can be very... Um, difficult to distinguish from the good seed because there are all sorts of things insinuating into our lives, into our society, into all sorts of things in the world which are not of the Lord, which are of the, of the enemy. And you could get quite depressed thinking about this, but we're not to because the good seed continues to grow and prosper. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So this is not only a, a parable that talks about the here and now, it's also a parable that talks about the end times. What will the harvest, what will the harvest be? The harvest will be the end of the ages when God comes in judgment to distinguish between those who are his children and those who are not. And so it's a quite a sober um, illustration really of the lives that we live because there should be no mistaking. It's easy to sort of um, gloss over some of the teaching in the Bible about the about the, the, the end of the kingdom of well, the kingdom of God and how it comes to its culmination. Um, and it sometimes can be a bit uncomfortable to listening, but it's fundamental. And the fact that Jesus Himself talks about it, and that's why you know, as part of this Get Serious series, um, I think it's very important that this is one of the factors that we we take into account. So. Why did Jesus tell this particular parable when he did? And I think the, the clue really lies in that last line about he who has ears, let him hear. This is not Jesus making a prejudgment on people as, the, as they are at that moment. He's saying this is a warning. Take note of this because you've got a choice here. You can either be part of God's kingdom, good seed, or you can be part of another kingdom which faces a bad future so it's a warning that we should take note of he who has ears let him hear and in this illustration we have this cosmic conflict between God and Satan 
And Satan's great desire is to compromise and wreck the harvest by, by infiltrating the crop, by deception, deception, by entwinement, that picture of the, 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 the roots growing together and tangling themselves up. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to undermine God's work in this world. But we, of the good seed, are God's children. And we continue, continue to grow by God's blessing alongside the stuff. And ultimately, the good seed will have the, will have the victory. So we are in there as God's children, growing and bearing fruit against opposition. So we can think, well, this life's pretty tough seeing all this bad stuff going on. But God says, you are strong enough and good enough to remain here. I am not going to put you all aside into a little monastery type place where there is, there is only one thing to do. We're going to put, keep you in the world, but I want you to be in the world, but not of the world. That's the key distinction, in the world, but not of the world. And it's interesting, there's, this, that there's the fact that you know, God has... Um, he, it says in Matthew, we have to look, live alongside evil influences, and it says in Matthew 5, he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So in this world, God is blessing us by the created and natural world all the time. We have the sun, we have the, we have the, the rain, we have all the good things in the world, and that's shared out equally between those of the righteous side and those the unrighteous. But that does shouldn't lull the unrighteous into thinking that everything is going to turn out good because it isn't. So lesson number one is we are living alongside difficult forces in the world but we are strong enough to combat them. The next lesson I believe in this is that we are not to be judgmental about situations because God himself is not separating out the wheat from the darnel until the end of time. In the same way, that, that applies to us as well. We are not going to be separated out from evildoers until the end of the, the harvest times. And in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says, Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. It's very easy to be judgmental, isn't it? Um, I think, I guess we're all prone to it at times. There are people who get on your nerves, being quite blunt about it. There are people who you think are going, doing silly things in silly ways. And we take a view about that, don't we? We're only human. But God says, you don't know what's going on always in other people's lives. And if you, keep, if you have a spirit of criticism within you, that is not of God's kingdom. A spirit of criticism in the church has been one of the great downfalls of the church over the years because there has been backbiting, there have been resentments, there have been attacks upon personalities. All those are bad things. We need simply to follow the word of God and act in humility and act in a spirit of mercy and a spirit of fellowship together. That is fundamental in the kingdom of God. And if we start to get critical about other people and even critical about situations which we don't know not, but we do have the word of God as our truth director. We can make, we can make our judgments based upon what the word of God tells us about what is right and what is wrong. And we can seek to persuade others of our opinion in that respect because we have the word of God as our, as our reference point, as our, as, our, as, our, um, as our standpoint. But that doesn't mean to say we should let, then let it become personal and critical about other people and, uh, and, and start to condemn them in our hearts because if we start to judge others in our hearts, what does scripture say? Judge not that ye be not judged. And that's quite an important thing. So, that was lesson number two about not judging others. I think the other th thing is really important to understand in, in all of this is that um, Satan would like us to think that there is no judgment and eternal punishment. 
he would dearly like us to think that at the end, the end of the ages, that well, when we when we die, that there is there are no consequences. We 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 just simply fade away, um, and there is no there is no aftermath to that. It's what some people call they use the word annihilation about because actual annihilation actually means that sort of literally fading away to nothing at all. But God tells us through this parable that there is a harvest and the harvest is a judgment time when the righteous are separated from the unrighteous. And what does it say about the unrighteous? They suffer an end that is of perpetual punishment. Perpetual punishment, not just a fading away. That's a hard truth um, but it's, I believe, the word of God, and I believe that to be the truth. Um, a fiery furnace is the illustration given in this parable. Um, that sounds pretty dreadful to me, but that's what it says. So, Satan, as I said, would love us not to think that that is, that is reality. And in 2 Corinthians 4, it says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. I'll read that again. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And in 2 Thessalonians 2 it says, The work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit, miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. We would all love to be saved. But to want to be saved, you've got to believe you, that you've got to be saved from something. You can't just be saved from nothing. So what are we saved from? We're saved from a punishment of, of eternal death by being children of Christ, we are brought into a new kingdom. And that's why we must turn against anything, any insinuations, any implications that Satan tries to put into our minds about what is true and what is not true, and we stick to the word of God in understanding that. But the wonderful thing is here, it says, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. <coughs> we have a hope that is just amazing. We are the good seed in the kingdom. We are being fruitful in the kingdom. That's what God wants us to be. He wants us to bear fruit, as, they, as the other parable of the sower says, good seed brings forth seed 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I was once staying in a farm in France. I never couldn't have credited that, that wheat could have 100 seeds on an ear until one day we were staying in a sheet down in France and there was a wheat field next to it and I actually picked, saw a, a, an ear of wheat with 100, 100 seeds on it. I thought, gosh, this is amazing. Um, and that is, the, that is what God's purpose is for us, to, have, to be fruitful in a world where there is so much going on that is dangerous and unfruitful. And for that, we need God's very special help to guide us through all of that. We need God's strength to help us to grow alongside those weeds. We need God's strength to help us be fruitful. We thank God for all the good things he's given us, but we need to, all the time, be mindful of what his intention and ambition for us is, which is for us to grow well and to be fruitful for his kingdom. This kingdom... What does he say at the beginning of that parable? This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like a field that we're growing up in. And I just thank God looking around this congregation. I see so many people growing very fruitfully in this congregation. I see, I'm incredibly encouraged by just seeing so many faces around this, around this room who I just see really moving in the spirit of God. And I think that is absolutely wonderful. And may, the, may that continue for a very long time to come. But, you know, we mustn't let our eyes come off the, off the purpose of God. And above all, we mustn't let Satan's lies and Satan's deceptions creep into our lives to discourage us and frustrate us. He has made us, God has made us strong enough to bear fruit in this world. And what does it say? 
he's going to give us that we're going to be able to like the sun in the kingdom. I think that's great. So it's one of those parables that tells you quite in very direct terms what is to be and what is now. But there's a, for us who are Christians, it is an encouragement. For those who are being challenged by the word of God, it should be a warning and an encouragement at the same time to shift your position, a paradigm shift towards the kingdom of God because that's what he wants you to come into. He has saved you from sin if you put your trust in him. What is sin? We often think, well, sin can sometimes get very confused in people's minds. But until we're conscious of the fact that there are things going on in our hearts and lives that are not of God, that are not right, God will give us that conscience about that. And then we can seek God's forgiveness. And when we seek God's forgiveness, he will save us and bring us into that new relationship with him. Amen? Yeah, let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are God of love and of mercy, but also a God of purpose. And your purpose, Lord, is for your people here. That, Father God, we go out into the world to grow and bear fruit, and we're able to stand against the forces of the enemy. That we are able to recognize the forces of the enemy, despite all their ways of showing us and deceiving us, trying to trick us. But, Lord, your word is strong and true, and we can believe in that and work on that basis. Lord, we just thank you for your love for us and for your enabling grace and power into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Simon, for sharing this with us. That has been a great message and very, very important to hear. We are at the end of this service now. If there's anyone who would like prayer, please feel free to speak to anyone who might be sitting next to you or who you might came with or who you know, I'm sure they'll be happy to pray for you. We're going to have tea and coffee outside, so please feel free to join us over there. Before we head out, though, I would like to thank everyone who has volunteered today and made this service possible. Thank you so much. I hope you have a lovely Sunday afternoon and a lovely bank holiday tomorrow as well.